There is one week left in the 2023 NFL season, and we are hardly going to talk about it because the Titans are eliminated from the playoffs. We're looking ahead to the offseason. Today, we're going to rank the Titans' biggest offseason needs, looking at them in tiers, so grouped by positions they need to upgrade, positions they should upgrade, and positions they'll be okay if they don't upgrade. We're also going to look at all the Titans' pending free agents and discuss who should be brought back, if any. And finally, we're going to look at the updated draft order and discuss how the Titans can get as high as number four in the draft. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me, as always, is Justin Mello. And Justin, as I just said, today we're going to talk about some of the biggest needs for this Titans team. I would like all of our YouTube listeners and watchers out there to comment below what are the biggest needs for this team in the offseason besides left tackle and wide receiver? I think we all know the two biggest needs are offensive line and pass catching help. But what other positions do you think the Titans should prioritize right after those two? Let us know in the comments below. Justin, how's it going? Doing well. Um, that game on Sunday was terrible. Um, I thought it was one of the it worst was. games of the Mike Vrabel era. Low key, to be honest with you. Certainly felt non-competitive from the very beginning. Uh, but as you said, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Sorry, my voice uh, isn't doing so well. It hasn't been doing well over the last couple of days. I've been battling. I had COVID a couple of weeks ago, and I think I caught another bug. So I'm working through a little bit of everything right now. But um, uh, certainly not a good performance by the team on Sunday. As you said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. I wanted to reserve maybe five minutes um, to applaud how terrible the left tackles were in this game, mm. both of them. Uh, but other than that, full-blown off-season mode, as you said. Yeah, so we can briefly touch on this game. The Titans lose 26-3. to As you said, it never even really felt competitive. I think the biggest takeaway from this game, aside from the poor left tackle play, is just to state that Will Levis left the, the uh, field on a cart, was taken back to the locker room. Ryan Tannehill played the m majority of this game. Mike Vrabel said on Tuesday that if Will Levis cannot go Sunday, Ryan Tannehill will start. However, Levis' status is still to be determined. So quickly, Justin... There's been some debate going around on Twitter. Should the Titans have even played Will Levis? Should they just shut him down for the season? I was fully on team. Play Levis if he's healthy. Give him the experience. Give him the snaps. But after watching Sunday's game, I started to wonder how valuable is this experience? Playing behind this O-line with so many guys done for the year on both sides of the ball with the pass catchers he's throwing to. It's like DeAndre Hopkins and pretty much nobody else, especially the way Traylon Burks is playing or not playing dropping that huge play at the beginning. Maybe it's a whole different game if Traylon Burks catches that deep ball at the beginning of the game. But I'm just I'm wondering what your what your take is here. Is it still valuable for Will Levis to get these reps? Or is there a chance playing behind this line that he develops some bad habits, starts seeing ghosts, starts getting happy feet in the pocket, learns to not trust his offensive line, which you'd hope next season is a group that he will be able to trust. Where do you fall on the should Will Levis play spectrum after watching Sunday's game? Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. The first thing I'll say is I thought they made the right decision by playing him in that game. You know, going into it, you had two games left. That's a lot of football. It's valuable experience. Um, he had been medically cleared to play. It's not like he was at, you know, 65% and they're playing him because they're, you know, they need to win this game. No, he had been medically cleared to play. I thought he was healthy enough to play. I thought they made the right decision. Now, it's a different conversation in week 18. I don't think it's the same conversation, and I don't think it means you're you're going back on what you initially believed because I don't expect him to be healthy enough to play this Sunday. I don't expect him to be medically cleared to play after leaving the game on a car. So it's a totally different situation from Week 17. I'll be stunned if we see him against Jacksonville on Sunday. Mike Vrabel did say, you know, TBD, TBD, excuse me, uh, he's made some strides since Sunday, which is probably mostly coach talk. You know, he said, I don't really anticipate him practicing on Wednesday. It's going to be Ryan Tannehill. I, I feel fairly confident saying Sunday against Jacksonville, which he also um, as, uh, confirmed, by the way, it would not be Malik Willis if it's not Will Levis. So uh, I haven't necessarily changed my mind because I think site is twenty twenty. I thought they should have played him in that game. It's a shame that he got hurt again. Um, but certainly um, I, I understood. I was on that team, and, and maybe I'm a stubborn asshole, but uh, I haven't changed my mind. I thought they made the right decision going into Sunday. 
Yeah, I feel the same way. I thought it was the right call, but then looking back at it, wondering if he is healthy enough to play this week, do you just say, look, man, take the last week of the season to get healthy so you can be ready to go when the offseason program starts? I kind of feel like that's where it's headed. Even if he, you know, even if the choice is between like a 70% Will Levis and a not healthy enough to play, where like 70% you say you you give it a go. If this was a team fighting for a playoff spot and you were confident in Will Levis' ability to make you a better team then yeah, you throw them out there. But in this situation, and I know the Titans want to win, even though it doesn't help their draft position, it helps the guys in the locker room have a better sense of accomplishment as the season comes to a close, especially against a division rival in Jacksonville, who if you beat them and the other right results happen, you could knock them out of the playoffs. I'm sure the Titans would love to do that. Mike Vrabel was even asked, uh, why, why why is it important to win this week, you know, given what it would do to the draft position? And he said, and I quote, Because it sucks to lose. It fucking sucks. Losing is awful. You don't sleep. (laughs) So the Titans obviously want to win this game. But even given that, I still think they probably are going to roll with Ryan Tannehill. You mentioned the left tackles. Let's talk about that really quick. So our buddy Wes, Wes on Broadway, tweeted this out uh, the other day. Left tackle Andre Dillard is now tied for the most sacks allowed this season with 12. Left tackle Jalen Duncan is now tied for fourth most sacks allowed this season with nine. The Titans left tackle position by itself has allowed four more sacks this year than the entire Bills offensive. Josh Allen has been sacked 21 times. The Titans off the Titans left tackle position has allowed 25, I believe, sacks this year. So that is a pretty wild stat, and I think that's a great jumping-off point for our off-season needs discussion as we start with the tier positions the Titans need to upgrade. Let's start with left tackle because if the Titans do not upgrade this position, the it doesn't matter what else they do in the off-season, I yep. feel they're not going to make significant enough strides to be a competitive football team. And I want to uh, bring up one more Mike Vrabel quote from Tuesday. He said... So he was asked about the pass protection and issues and everything. And we've hit hit on this a few times on this podcast, but but we've never had Vrabel come outright and just say what he said on Tuesday, which is that this team does not do well in drop back situations. Mike Vrabel said they need to be able to run the ball and be complimentary in order to succeed with the pass because there are matchup issues at times. So he's basically admitting, look, you know that game where we had all those first down handoffs and everyone got mad at us for running the ball over and over again into the teeth of a defense that was expecting a run? Well, look, we're doing that to protect our quarterback because our offensive line can't. Our left tackle certainly can't. So the only way we're going to have any success on offense is if we stick to that run game and get it going and find some success there. Even if it's not working, we have to stick with it because otherwise our quarterbacks are going to get killed in a straight drop back passing game because we do not have the offensive line to play that style of football. And I think that this is a huge point for Titans fans who... It's 100% true. And I love that he's you know just being completely honest with this assessment of his team right now. But... Titans fans seem to have this idea that Mike Vrabel doesn't want to run a drop back passing offense, that he wants to stick to the run game and just be, you know, boring and and stay on the ground and be conservative and all those things and not score points. Look, none of those things are true. This team is just completely hamstrung by the personnel issues and it starts up front. So as we look at positions, the Titans absolutely need to upgrade this offseason. Left tackle stands out far and away as the favorite there. Are there other positions on the offensive line, Justin, that you view as need to upgrade versus just it would be nice to upgrade? Yeah, I do, because I don't think you can really tiptoe around the issue any longer. I don't think you can be I don't think you can take a risk that this O-line is going to be bad again next year. You know what I mean? Like, I think you need to be aggressive. You need to really make, you can't do what you did this past off season, right? And just get a couple guys that you think might be upgrades. Look, I know there's no exact science. What you're saying is you can't go bargain bin shopping this off season. You got to go high quality. There's, There's no exact science to it, but you need to do your best to be sure that it's a lot better. And you know why you need to do that? Because if it's not, you might not be back in 2025, right? Now you're starting to talk about your job being on the line in truthfulness, right? Like that's why you need to make sure it's better. 
So yes, um, left tackle, as you said, it's far and away number one. And I agree. I liked what you said. I'll go a step further. The whole off season is essentially a complete failure, no matter what you do. If you don't <laughs> upgrade that left tackle spot significantly, everything else will be a failure. It will not matter. Right. So, and, and as I answer the second part of your question, yeah, you know, it, as much as that's number one, I think I put right tackle and, and center um, on that list of, of you have to be better, right? Like with Aaron Brewer, he's a, first of all, he's an unrestricted free agent, not sure he's going to be back. Um, we've reached a point where you thought moving him to center was really going to help him in pass protection, right? He's going to be a lot better. It was logical. He's, he's undersized. He's got short arms. He lack, you know, less one-on-one opportunities. He's still giving up a ton of pressures in the passing game, according to pro football focus charting. And according to our eye test, right? Not just them. We've seen it, right? We see it every Sunday. And certainly at right tackle, I, I feel the same way now. Yeah, if, if you have the, the the significant upgrade at left tackle, it might not be quite as important, but you need to get a guy there that, A, you know, hopefully can, can hold his own on in one-on-one situations, and B, you know, yeah, I might have to give trip help on occasion, but I'd like to get a guy that I don't have to give trip help to on every single rep. Yeah. Right or every single drop back. So yeah, I, I think at center and right tackle, um, you know they're they're in that tier. They're two and three potentially. Uh, I I might put wide receiver certainly ahead of one of them, but they're very high on my list is what I'm trying to say because you need to be sure you can't go into the next year with a rookie left tackle number one, a sophomore Peter Skaronski, and then say oh we're just gonna re-sign Aaron Brewer and bring back Dylan Radens at right tackle or bring back Chris Hubbard. No. That leaves too much room for error, too much margin for error. Um, it, it can't be that. No, it's got to be significantly better, at least on paper. And if it goes disastrous on the field, that'll suck. But you say, hey, we try. If you end up with an Andy uh, Levitree, if you remember that big free agent signing, or you end up with a Chance Warmack, that sucks. But at least you can say, damn, you know, we were really, really confident we were getting a really good football player here. We did our best to try to get a really good football player. They, they've got to try. Yeah, I totally agree. You talk about Aaron Brewer's struggles in pass protection. So I'm looking at the PFF advanced stats right now. Aaron Brewer is tied for the top spot amongst all centers in terms of pressures allowed. So he's allowed more pressures than everyone but one center who he's tied with. That's 34 pressures on the season. And when it comes to sacks, he has allowed, he's tied for having allowed the second most sacks of any of any center in the NFL this year. So at that particular position, the Titans just are, you know, it's one thing if you're getting some interior pressure, but your tackles are solid and you can navigate outside the pocket, or if you're your interior solid and your tackles are getting beat, but you can kind of push them back around the arc so the QB can step up in the pocket. If you're getting beat around the edge and getting beat directly up the middle, you don't stand a chance. So it's almost hard to even get a true evaluation of what Will Levis is able to do, or even, you know, as Ryan Tannehill heads into the offseason, what he could be for a team next year when you're playing behind this kind of offensive line. I think that goes back to our discussion of Will Levis likely sits out this final game of the season because you just can't risk him suffering a major, major injury that's going to impact his offseason work. So I think at this point, the you know, with two games left and you weren't sure how the Titans were going to play and they still fresh, somewhat fresh off that Miami win where the offensive line did okay, you think, all right, let's get Will Levis out there. He can navigate a muddy pocket. That'll be a good life lesson for his future career in the NFL. But now at this point, I'm thinking... You got such a bad offensive line out there. You don't know who's going to play left tackle. Andre Dillard and Jalen Duncan both played reps at left tackle in this game, and they both were horrible. So it doesn't even matter who it is. The the guys just can't get it done. So I agree. I think right tackle, I'm going to push back on you a little bit at right tackle. I agree. You know, it'd be ideal if you had someone that you didn't have to send help their way almost every snap. But I do think if you were able to bring back a guy like Chris Hubbard, that is a serviceable level of play where he's going to need help at times. He's going to give give up some pressures here and there. If he's your weak link, though, you know, on this offensive line this season, he might have been the, the best or second best player at times, which that's not acceptable. You cannot have that. But if your worst player, if your weak link is that right tackle spot and you can give it some help and your quarterback knows he may have to step up or avoid pressure coming from that side here and there, I think you can survive. Ideally, You want to upgrade it. So I'm going to slide that one. I'm going to slide right tackle for myself personally for my tier list. I'm going to slide right tackle down to positions you would like to upgrade, but don't necessarily need to upgrade. 
Elsewhere on offense, I think wide receiver is far and away, we know, the second biggest position of need for this team. And, you know, you're looking at a, a situation where heading into free agency, you know, a lot can happen. We still don't know. But right now, looking ahead all the way to the draft, the Titans probably need to go left tackle round one, wide receiver round two, or some combination of those two positions in the first two rounds. Or maybe, you know, they trade around and figure something else out. But I think you got to come out of the first two rounds of the draft with a new left tackle and a new pass catching threat. And I think the wide receiver position is where that should go. Now, there are going to be some free agents that the Titans could pursue. Depends who's actually going to hit the market. So we'll save that conversation for a little bit later date when we have a better idea of what guys may or may not be actually hitting the market. If we get some reports out there about what teams are planning to do with the franchise tag when it comes to guys like Michael Pittman Jr., T. Higgins, Mike Evans, we can get into that discussion. But for now, we'll just keep it broad and say wide receiver is a huge position of need. It is one that you cannot enter next season without significantly upgrading and I'm talking about significant upgrades spending premium draft capital or spending lots of money lots of your salary cap on that position that doesn't mean drafting a Colton Dowell in the sixth or seventh round again or a Des Fitzpatrick in the on day three of the draft like you need to go out and attack this position with resources pour resources into the offensive line and wide receiver everything else can sort itself out through free agency, through the the second and third day of the draft, through UDFA signings and and that kind of thing. But these two positions, more than any other left tackle and wide receiver, you have got to attack. And speaking of Colton Dowell, Paul Kaharski reported on Tuesday that Dowell has torn an ACL. He will obviously miss the rest of this season. And given the time frame right now, it's January. He's likely going to miss most, if not all, of the next season as well. This isn't a guy that should have been impacting the Titans' plans anyway. You don't go into next offseason saying we're good at wide receiver four slash special teamer because we have Colton Dowell. But given his injury now, it it just even further accentuates how badly the Titans need to upgrade at that position. Yeah, it's extremely important. And look, we've had this discussion. Um, I'd like to see them add a veteran through free agency, and I'd like to see them spend a premium draft capital. I don't know that they'll do both of those things. I hope they do. Uh, I don't know that they will, right? We'll have to see how what their approach is. And, you know, they might prioritize another uh, big money free agent, like a Jalen Johnson, for example, yeah. at corner or, or uh, two offensive linemen, for example. So we'll see how they approach this position. But certainly, and I've said it multiple times, um, at, at that top of the second round where they're going to be picking 37, 38, 39, 40th overall, whatever it is, I think there's going to be a, a pretty good football player uh, for them to take there at the wide receiver position. And that's why I prefer to address it in the second round. I mean, you look yesterday, there are some great, look, if they miss out on those tackles, you see the way Roma Dunze played, uh, played for Washington yesterday, outstanding player, top 10 uh, in this draft, in my opinion, Malik neighbors at LSU, outstanding player. Um, but then you saw some of the other guys as well. AD Mitchell at Texas, you know, I'm not convinced that he's a first round pick in all honesty. I, I think there's a chance he's there in the early to mid thirties. Uh, you saw that he can be a game breaker, especially down in the red zone where he's elite in those one-on-one jump ball opportunities. I think Xavier worthy, although he didn't have his best game, he did finally come up with one of those big grabs in the fourth quarter. Um, I think he's a guy that, you know, would typically scare me a little based on the size and the size of his hands. And, but I, I think of Will Levis's, uh, you know, pension for throwing the deep ball, and, and that intrigues me a lot in this offense, right? And what Xavier Worthy can maybe do. And also what he does on special teams as an elite yeah. returner. So there are going to be a lot of receivers, I think, in that sector. LSU's Brian Thomas is another one that's intriguing. Starting to get a lot of first-round buzz. I don't know if I'm there with him yet personally. You saw Jalen Polk at Washington yesterday have a, a big game. So there are going to be so many receivers available to this team um, I think when they're picking in the second round that uh, they're going to have to go ahead and get a guy and pair him with DeAndre Hopkins because certainly um, Traylon Burks, you talked about that drop on Sunday. Every time he gets a chance to prove that he should receive another opportunity to be their second receiver next year, he just disappoints you every single time. Yeah. So uh, there's no way in hell uh, they could go into next season really relying on Traylon Burks to be anything. I would honestly be most comfortable with him as wide receiver four. That's my personal opinion. I'm not convinced they'll feel the same. They still got so much invested in him. They've still seen some potential. So it wouldn't shock me if they give him a chance to be wide receiver three, uh, but certainly he can't be your wide receiver two. No, I just imagine Xavier Worthy on that post route that Traylon Burks dropped on Sunday and think like, 
that's a touchdown if it's a if it's Xavier Worthy. If it's a true deep threat guy who can separate down the field and and track the ball well over his shoulder. I mean, uh, Romo Dunze, for example, the way that he is able to track the oh. ball. Also, Jalen Polk. I mean, these guys we saw it on Monday night. Like they are elite ball trackers and they have great hands. The late hands we saw flash from Romo Dunze on that one down the sideline. I mean, that these guys are are difference making type of players that the Titans could really use. Let's let's finish up an assessment of the offense here. Are there any other positions you see as need to upgrade this offseason? And if not, where do you go when you're talking about would be pretty nice to upgrade? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to run through this quickly because I don't think they deserve a lot of attention. But but three of Agreed. the positions, we focused a lot on the offensive line and wide receiver as we should. Three positions that could be intriguing are backup quarterback. You know, you're not bringing yeah. Ryan Tannehill back. So do you do you dip into the veteran market and try to get a vet QB to sit behind Will Levis and maybe help him with the ropes? Or do you just go with Malik Willis as your number two? Um, they only have two tight ends, I believe, under contract heading into next year. That's Chiga Conquo and, uh, and Josh Wiley. So do you re-sign a Trayvon Wesco? Or do you look to bring in a, another tight end through the draft or maybe another guy, a more dynamic guy in free agency? And then probably the biggest one I say for last is who pairs with Tajay Spears next season is that are you re-signing Derrick Henry are you bringing in a cheaper veteran like a Gus Edwards or a Deontay Foreman or whoever or are again are you maybe spending a day three pick at running back more of a power type goal line back that that could pair well with Tajay Spears so I think those are three positions they they, they probably address at some point again either through re-signing guys on their own team um, or, or looking at the uh, day three or uh, the veteran pool market, the, the cheap veteran pool market for all three of those positions. You're not going to spend big money there. So I think all three of those fall into the bucket of uh, it'd be nice and you'd like to upgrade them, but they're not needs. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think even running back, you might put in the category of you don't necessarily need an upgrade. And when you're talking about upgrades, like they're going to need a, a body for sure, whether that's Henry or somebody else. But if your starting running back is Tajay Spears and you get somebody who can compliment him and spell him and maybe play special teams, like I don't want to bring this name up, but I'm going to because I'm already down this path. But like Hassan Haskins, for example, a guy who plays special teams and can take some running back carries or Julius Chestnut falls into that category as well. I think Jonathan Ward is a little bit um, repetitive of what Tajay Spears gives you. And Tajay Spears has more juice. So I don't know if you know, you're looking that direction, but I think, you know, a Julius Chestnut type of guy, whether it's him or somebody like him, that's a position that you don't necessarily need to upgrade. You just need to add a body. Backup quarterback, I think, is one that that would be nice to upgrade because now, uh, for all the reasons you said, you know, getting a veteran guy in there can help mentor Will Levis a little bit, show him the ropes, but also just because in his short time as a starting quarterback, and maybe it's the offensive line, Will Levis has shown to be a little bit injury prone. And I don't mean like, I don't mean it as a huge concern or, or, Anything that would mean the Titans need to replace him, but it's definitely something to think about because we've seen how many starting quarterbacks went down in the 2023 season alone and teams with backup quarterbacks vying for or already in the playoffs. You got teams like the Cleveland Browns, Indianapolis Colts, like there are teams out there that are playing backup quarterbacks and still succeeding the Cincinnati Bengals to some extent. Um, and, and truthfully, there's going to be a lot of them available on the market, or at least there are currently there are scheduled to be a lot of them. Obviously, you know, Kirk Cousins and Ryan Tannehill are probably the, the, the believe it or not, the high end starting quarterbacks that are available in free agency. But some, you know, Jacoby Brissett to Rod Taylor, Sam Darnold, Jameis Winston, Drew Locke. Uh, Gardner Minshew, again, I don't expect him back. Uh, I, don't, I don't expect him to actually hit the market, I don't think. But Gardner Minshew, uh, Josh Dobbs, a, a fan favorite around these parts, Trevor Simeon, Mason Rudolph. Like, there's so many quarterbacks right now that are on expiring contracts that would be an upgrade at backup quarterback. I, you know, I think Terod Taylor is someone that stands out to me as a capable veteran that knows Mike Vrabel well, right? Spent some time with some members of this staff down in Houston. I think he would probably top my list. Um, but I, I, I look at guys like Sam Darnold in all honesty would in, intrigue me a lot as well. I think as a guy that might be able to come in in case of injury and actually play good football, you know, if there are, if there are good things around them, if they, if they do what we said they need to do on the O-line and wide receiver. So certainly I, I don't think they'll have a difficult time upgrading back a quarterback if they choose to. Yeah. And then the last position you mentioned, tight end agreed, you know, Chig Conquo took a little bit of a step back has been better in recent weeks, but 
Having another threat there would be great. I don't think this is like you should go draft Brock Bowers in the top 10. I think that that would be incredibly dumb to draft a tight end in the top 10, given this team's other needs. But at some point in the draft or in free agency, you address the position. It'd be nice to upgrade it, but you could probably survive with the guys you have if you needed to or or similar level players. Looking at the defensive side of the ball, mm, now this is about resource allocation and everything. Right. Do you need to upgrade anywhere on the defense? Now, the defense hasn't been great this year. They've had some games where they kept them in the game. They've had some games where it didn't matter how well the defense played. The offense just couldn't get anything going. I will say that I probably feel like cornerback is an area you need to upgrade if you want to be truly competitive. I say that also admitting that I believe you should spend all your resources on offense in this era of the NFL you got to be able to score points when you need to score points. And if your defense has given up points, then match it by scoring more. If you need to have a game-winning drive, go score. If you are on the defensive end of a potential game-winning drive, let them score and go score again. <laughs> That's where I'm at with the defense. Like, yeah, it'd be nice to upgrade every position on defense because the Titans could use it. But I think as far as need to upgrade, I will probably admit, yes, cornerback is an area that should fall into that category. I just don't know how I feel about spending resources there if it means not spending resources on offense. <laughs> I get what you're saying, but I am going to put corner back in the need to upgrade bucket. I mean, first of all, have you looked at the corners that are under contract for next year? <laughs> I'll round them off to you real quick, okay? Uh, Roger McCreary, Trey Avery, Caleb Farley, Eric Garrar, and Anthony Kendall. Okay? I mean, like, this they don't have one, not one, starting outside corner on the roster right now. Not one. Because Roger McCreary is a nickel. I don't care what anyone says. He's shown you that time and time again. When he has to play outside, he's small. He's got short arms. He gets bullied by bigger boundary receivers. He can't play it. He's a nickel. So they don't have a single outside corner. So it's a need to upgrade. And I get what you're saying. We want to see this team spend so much money on offense. But you know what? They're going to have a lot of cap space. Okay, they've got, they're going to have close to what? Somewhere between 90 to 100 million, probably, when all said and done, when they've cut some guys, they can restructure a guy or two, whatever. They're going to have 90 to 100 million dollars in cap space. Corner is a need to upgrade. It's absolutely a need to upgrade. And they've got to get a good one. They've got to spend a lot of money. And guess what? You know this as well as I do. And we've seen the way teams manipulate the salary cap, okay? They can sign a corner, give them 15, 16 million dollars a year. OK, and that might not get you a guy like Jalen Johnson, who apparently wants 20, 22 million. But if they get a guy and pay him 16 million dollars a year at corner, that cap hit can be as low as what? 10 million in the first year, maybe even less. So you could do that and still spend a lot of your resources offensively. So I'm still going to put corner in that need to. I mean, they probably need two of them. In all honesty, I don't even think one does the trick. They need to go out and get two. Uh, you know, starting caliber court. One of them's got to be really good, and another one's got to be a guy that's a starting caliber player that you can live with. Yeah, and you know, this is going to be a big market for cornerback this offseason, and I think Jalen Johnson may be the, the top guy on the, on the market if, you know, the Bears don't just franchise tag him or try to re-sign him anyway. But there are a ton of guys, recognizable names, that are going to be free agents this offseason. I'm just going to read a list off to you. Just to keep in mind as we go through the process here, Adoree Jackson, Kendall Fuller, Stephon Gilmore, Michael Davis, Jeff Akuda, Kenny Moore, Chidobe Awuzie, Emmanuel Mosley, C.J. Henderson, Jordan Lewis, Steven Nelson, Levi Wallace, Rock Yassin, Jalen Mills, Sean Murphy Bunting, Shaq Griffin, Noah Igbenogany, Miles Bryant, Kawan Williams, Trey Herndon, Justin Hardy, Tavier Thomas, Dane Jackson, Nick Needham, Ronald Darby, Eli Apple, Antonio Hamilton, Michael Ford, Christian Fulton, of course, Fabian Moreau. There's a ton of guys on this list. Some former high draft picks, some more in the veteran uh, late stage of their career type of guys. But there are going to be so many cornerbacks that flood the market that I think it will, you know, depress the price a little bit of some of the guys. The top guys are still going to get the top money. Jalen Johnson, like you said, maybe in the 20 plus million dollar range. But other guys, you're going to be able to find some sort of bargain style guys, sort of like how the Titans signed Sean Murphy Bunting last year. And as we uh, transition our conversation into pending free agents and who we would want the Titans to bring back, we'll get there in a second as we finish up the defense. But keep Sean Murphy Bunting's name in mind because I think he's going to be on our list there. Looking at the rest of the defense, linebacker, would it be nice to upgrade? Yeah, they could survive if they don't upgrade at linebacker. If you bring back Aziz Alshire and Jack Gibbons, I think you're fine. Like you could be better, obviously. You can always be better, but I think you're fine there. Defensive line, edge rusher position, 
look, if you stay healthy there, I think you're fine with the group you have in Arden Key, Harold Landry, Jeffrey Simmons. Obviously, you would want to probably bring back Danico Autry or replace him. But if you keep the same group together by bringing back Autry, I think you're fine on the D-line and at the edge rusher position. You know, you got guys that could get more opportunities like Travis Gibson in a rotational role, Rashad Weaver here and there, I guess, you know. Again, it'd be nice to upgrade, but you don't need to. And safety, I feel the same way. Amani Hooker, get him back healthy. I thought Elijah Molden actually played pretty well as a safety for the majority of this year. Kayvon Wallace is not terrible. I mean, he missed a run fit pretty bad in the this game on Sunday. But other than that, I mean, you can survive with those guys. So I think if you don't upgrade any other position on defense... You're not hurting. Now, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go sign a, an interior defensive lineman and really form like a truly stout defensive interior, somebody to play next to Jeffrey Simmons. There are some free agents that are interesting. Justin Matabuke probably stands out as the, at the top of the list for me uh, in Baltimore. He's like 12 and a half, 13 sacks, something like that this season. He's going to get a massive contract. He may be back with Baltimore. We'll see. But I do think if he hits the market, like there's a chance that it, you could upgrade these positions, but... For the rest of the defense, to me, it's, it all falls in the bucket of somewhere between it'd be nice to upgrade and you can survive without upgrading because, frankly, defense is just not as important as having a good offense in the NFL as we watch it this season. Yeah, I'm mostly with you where I'm going to say a lot of these positions for me fall into you'd like to upgrade. The only reason I'm not saying you need to is because this is just me being aware that unfortunately this team, this roster is so bad that they can't upgrade <laughs> everything in one offseason. So they, they are right. going to have to pick and choose. They're going to have to prioritize. But with me saying that, I'll be honest, I don't like what they have on paper right now. Now this is going to change a lot, as we said, but I want to talk about some of those positions more in-depthly. Defensive line. Do you know who's under contract right now on the D-line heading into 2024? It is Jeffrey Simmons, Quinton Bohana, Keandre Coburn, and Shackle Brown. Jeffrey Simmons is the only one, right? That's a that's a starting caliber. Obviously, he's high-end, but he's the only one that's a starting caliber player. They need multiple bodies on the D-line that could actually play. Because from what we've seen, none of those... I mean, you want to bring Keandre Coburn back as like your sixth D-lineman? Maybe. But they need a second, third, fourth, and fifth, right? Based on the way the roster's shaping up right now. I don't like what they have at safety really outside of Amani Hooker. I think Elijah Molden's been okay. He's one of three safeties under contract. It's just him, Hooker, and Mike Brown. Kayvon Wallace is scheduled to be an unrestricted free agent. Of course, you could bring him back on the cheap. Yeah, you know, if those are if that's your group of four, you might be able to survive. It's not very good, in all honesty. Maybe you get by. I agree with you. I look at linebacker. That's another spot that's, that's hurt and bad, right? I mean, Luke Gifford, Chance Campbell, these are some of the guys who are under contract. Otis Reese, um, as Esel Shire, as we both know, scheduled for unrestricted free agency. That's a bad group without him. It's a really bad group without him. So, you know, and even at edge, right? I mean, we, we want to bring back Dean Nicolatri. It's not as straightforward as we think, right? He's going to be turning, what, 34 next season. That'll certainly impact negotiations and how comfortable the Titans are and, and how much they pay him. It'll also impact what other teams think he's worth, right? So perhaps the Titans get a good deal there. Uh, but certainly Arden Key, Harold Landry, Rashad Weaver and Caleb Murphy right now are the four edges under contract. That's not good enough, right? I think you bring back Dina Colatri, you like that group. You don't really have to touch it. Or Of course, you always see some back-end moves. Maybe you bring back Marlon Davidson, who I think has been okay um, since signing on yeah. to the 53 from the practice squad. But uh, if you're not bringing back Dina Colatri, I, I think you need something else there. I don't think you can just go in with Arden Key and Harold Landry, certainly. Um, into next season. So I think all those positions, D-line, hedge, linebacker, safety, they all need upgrades, but I think because of everything else you need to do, they sort of fall in, you know, you'd like to upgrade and maybe it's not um, of the utmost importance based on everything else you're dealing with. Yeah, so let's recap here really quickly. I'm just going to uh, group these positions that you need to upgrade, we said. Left tackle slash offensive line in general, wide receiver, cornerback. Positions you would like to upgrade but don't necessarily need to upgrade. Tight end, backup quarterback, maybe a defensive line depth, safety depth, linebacker. And then positions that you can survive without upgrading. Running back, 
maybe some of those defensive positions fall into that category as well. So that's that's the basic recap. Tight there. end as well, Justin, right? Tight end as well. Oh, tight end. Tight end as well. Yes, thank you. All right, Justin, we're running over on time here in this episode. So let's just quickly run through the list of pending free agents here on the tight that the Titans have that will be guys that will hit the market this offseason unless the Titans make some moves in the very, very near future. And then um, we're not going to discuss necessarily who they should bring back because if you've been following our podcast for a while, you know we like to go through the offseason here. Every episode or so, we'll pick a few guys, a handful of guys on this list, and we'll focus a, a real conversation on discussing the merits of bringing them back. Yeah, in-depthly, bringing them back or letting them walk in free agency and what what would the Titans would be able to replace them with. So quickly, here is the list. I'll start with the restricted free agents. Calvin Throckmorton and Chris Williamson. Who is Chris Williamson, you ask? He's a cornerback. You've probably never heard of him. <laughs> the, um, the exclusive rights free agents the Titans have are Julius Chestnut, TK McClendon on the defensive line and linebacker Jack Gibbons set to hit the market as well. Now the unrestricted free agent list. This one is much longer. Here goes in order of what, how much money they made in the 2023 season. Ryan Tannehill, Derek Henry, Danico Autry, Aziz Alshire, Aaron Brewer, Sean Murphy Bunting, Terrell Edmonds, Christian Fulton, Morgan Cox, the long snapper, wide receiver Chris Moore, tackle Chris Hubbard, Nick Westbrook Aquina, Travis Gibson, Trayvon Wesco, you mentioned earlier in this episode. Corey Levin, the linebacker Joe Jones, defensive tackle Marlon Davidson, defensive tackle Ross Blacklock, and finally safety Kayvon Wallace. Uh, there's a lot of starters in that group. You know, Derek Henry, Danico Autry, Aziz Alshire, Aaron Brewer, Sean Murphy Bunting, Christian Fulton, Morgan Cox, Chris Moore, Chris Hubbard when he was healthy, Nick Westbrook Akine, Trevon Wesco. All those guys fall into a sort of starter category or starting in a certain package personnel group category there, top of the depth chart at least in certain packages. That's a big group. That's a big list. So we're going to dive into those names over the coming weeks and discuss which ones are priorities to be brought back for this Titans team and which ones they can let go. But that's that's a pretty pretty long list there, Justin. It's a very long list. and It's good for you and I. It means we're going to have some very intriguing <laughs> offseason content. If you remember... Uh, our listeners, we usually pick two high end guys, do a couple episodes. Like, we want to pick like a Dina Coatri and a Derrick Henry and pair that into one episode. A Ryan Dan, I don't know if there's anyone else, a Ryan Tannehill and a Christian Fulton, whatever the heck um, we decide to do. And then we usually do one super sized episode where we'll run through like 15, 20 guys in one episode and spend, you know, maybe three to four minutes per guy, um, you know, uh, based on their importance to the team. So uh, it's a lengthy list. It, what does it tell you? It tells me the same thing it tells me every offseason, in all honesty, is that this team is going to look significantly different next season. I recently talked about that, by the way, with the Zsell Shire. I published an interview, you may or may not have read it a few weeks ago, where I asked him about what's left to play for. You know, and I thought he was really honest, and I believed his assessment. He said, look, he was every year there's a lot of roster turnover in this locker room. And I believe if you are not somebody that's in that locker room, it's easy for you and I to be like, just lose all these games. Who cares, right? We get that. But if you're in that locker room, you're like, you know what? I really like this guy to the left of me. I really like this guy to the right of me. We know that we only have so much time left together right? Realistically, let's go and maximize it. Let's go play for each other. Let's win some games. Let's have some good times together. Let's make sure we enter free agency with a little bit more value at our back. We played well down the stretch of the season here. So um, there's a lot of turnover every year in the NFL. That's why these guys care about week 17, week 18. And they really, really do, even though they've been, he, he told, as he said to me, I thought it was a great point. He goes, I was in San Francisco one year. We got eliminated from the playoffs much earlier than the Titans did this year. We had, we had six games left to play that didn't matter at the time we were eliminated. And I think they went six and 10 that year. They won a couple towards the end of the year. And by the way, they've made the playoffs every year since. So, and with the same coach, <laughs> same GM that were there, by the way. Right. So, uh, so much for hurting it, hurting the culture or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So, um, but, but that's why these make for intriguing conversations, right? There's only so much time left and you and I are definitely going to take our time analyzing all of the players that may or may not be back. Yeah, I agree. So in closing here, I think that was a good segue into this closing segment I want to do, Justin, which is looking at the updated draft order and how the Titans can get as high as four or as low as eight this coming weekend with the final week of the regular season on deck here. So the Titans currently will be picking seventh if it, things remain unchanged after the final game of the season. There are two other five and 11 teams that are tied with the Titans. It's the same two teams they were tied with last week, the New York Giants and the Los Angeles Chargers. 
The teams above them that have four wins, which, you know, is mathematically within striking distance of where the Titans are if the Titans lose and they all win. Those teams are the Washington Commanders, the New England Patriots, no change from last week with those two. A new foe has entered the the ring here, and that is the Arizona Cardinals, who surprised everyone by beating Philly last weekend and got themselves up to 4-12. and 12. So the path to the number four pick, Justin, now they will not, no matter what happens this weekend, they will not pass the Commanders or the Patriots in draft order. Even if the Commanders and Patriots both win and the Titans lose and they all finish the season 5-12, and 12, the Titans will not pass those two teams. Why? Because they cannot pass them in strength of schedule. Titans' strength of schedule is too difficult. Giants, or sorry, Commanders and Patriots' strength of schedule is too easy. The Titans cannot pass either of those two teams, which means the highest they can pick is four. The way they get there, losing to the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Cardinals need to beat the Seattle Seahawks, who are playing to get into the playoffs. So that is a huge game there for Seattle and for Arizona. If Arizona wins that game and Tennessee loses, Tennessee will pass Arizona. The strength of schedule, Arizona is one of the very few teams in the top 10 of the draft order right now. They are the only team in the top 10 of the draft order that are that have a harder strength of schedule than the Titans. And they're one of two teams that are even close to the Titans even potentially being able to pass them. So that is a realistic spot the Titans can move up. The Cardinals beat the Seahawks in a game where that means everything for Seattle For Arizona, what are they playing for? They're playing to spoil their division rivals' hopes of getting to the playoffs. Kyler Murray is auditioning to prove that he still should be the starting quarterback and they shouldn't draft one of those top guys this season. This is a big deal for Arizona. They'd like to win that game, so hopefully they can for the Titans' sake. The other two teams are the Giants and the Chargers. The Titans could theoretically pass either the Giants or the Chargers. Now, the Titans are not going to get ahead of the Giants in strength of schedule. So there's no rooting guide that can put it all together that puts the Titans ahead of the Giants in terms of the strength of schedule tiebreakers, which means you need the Giants to win. The Giants play the Eagles this weekend. Nick Sirianni said that the Giants would consider resting some starters this weekend as they need a lot to go right for them to have a chance at winning the division. The Giants play the Eagles this weekend. If the Eagles win and and the Cowboys lose to the Commanders, that is how the Eagles can still win the NFC East and host a home playoff game. However, if the Eagles win and the Cowboys beat a bad Commanders team, then the Eagles don't move at all. Those two games are at the same time on Sunday. So there is a chance, Nick Sirianni said, that they would consider resting starters. You kind of hope that they do, because that would give the Giants a much better chance of beating the Eagles Even if they don't, the Eagles proved, I think, over the course of the last few weeks that they're a beatable team. The Giants proved that they are willing to stay competitive and try to win some of these games. They couldn't pull it out against the Rams, although they had multiple chances late in that game to do so. So I think, you know, you root for the Giants to beat the Eagles. It's still very, very possible that that comes true. The last one is the Chargers and the Chiefs. Now, the the Chiefs are locked in to the three seed. So they're not really playing for any movement up or down the standings this weekend. The Chargers with an interim head coach, Giff Smith, they're all playing for pride at this point. Again, they'd love to beat another team that would love to beat a division rival in the final week of the season, especially if the Chiefs do decide to rest some of their starters and get ready and get healthy for the playoffs. That could be huge for the Titans there if the Chargers are able to win. If the Chargers do not win, They are the one team that the Titans could pass in terms of strength of schedule tiebreaker because they are so close right now, just separated by 0.003 percentage points in the strength of schedule there. So that there is a chance that the Chargers could end up falling behind the Titans in the draft order, even with a loss on Sunday. Now, if you're not a draft order guy, if you're a I'm rooting for my team to win no matter what guy. That's fine. I totally support you rooting for that, especially given it's the final game of the season. It's your last chance to watch this team play football for nine-ish months. That, That, I totally get it, especially when you also consider that the Titans have a chance to knock Jacksonville out of the playoffs. If the, if the Jacksonville Jaguars lose and the Pittsburgh Steelers win this weekend, Steelers playing on Saturday against the Ravens. So you'll know going into that, into the Sunday. We're playing for nothing. We're Ravens playing for nothing. Yes, the Ravens have already locked up the number one overall seed, so a Ravens team playing for nothing. If the Steelers win and the Titans win, the Jags will miss the playoffs. But uh, So that would be kind of fun. If that does happen, the Titans would be picking as low as eighth. So even if they win this weekend and all the other things don't go according to plan, you know, the Chargers and the Giants and the strength of schedule and the Cardinals and all that, the lowest the Titans would fall is eighth pick. 
So you're not really giving up that. You're not you're trading one spot in the draft for a week 18 win to potentially knock your division rival out of the playoffs. If you want to root for the Titans to win, who am I to tell you not to do so? I think, you know, have fun with your last week of the season. Personally, I'm rooting for the highest draft pick possible. I'm rooting for this team to get up to number four. I think that really sets you up for the future. And I know the draft is a crapshoot and you never know what's going to happen. And everybody wants to talk about, well, you, you, draft position doesn't matter. Root for your team to win because you never know who you're going to pick and if they're going to pan out and blah, 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 blah. And that's all true. But you also have a higher chance of turning your team around quickly if you get a higher pick. And I'll take the higher percentage chances of that happening every day of the week. I mean, you look at some of these teams that are in the playoffs right now that turned things around quickly. They picked high in the draft and they got franchise changing players. If the Titans can come out of this draft with a Panay Sewell type of guy to bolster their offensive line, look at how the Lions have been able to turn things around recently with, with a high draft pick. Look at what the Bengals did when they were able to add Jamar Chase. I mean, there are countless examples of these true difference maker guys that these teams that had quick turnarounds or that went from bad to good quickly, and that doesn't mean they weren't bad for a long time before they suddenly became good, but it wasn't like a gradual, you know, we're going to go 5 and 12, and then we're going to go 7 and 9, and then we're going to go 8 and 9, or 7 and 10, and then we're going to go 8 and 9, and then we're going to be competitive for the playoffs in four years. It wasn't like that. It was like one or two really good draft classes with some high, high, high premium picks involved, and they were able to turn things around. If you really want the Titans to be competitive sooner than later, look, I know it doesn't guarantee anything, but picking fourth is a huge deal compared to picking eighth. Now, picking 15th compared to picking 20th, not that big of a deal. But you're talking top four versus top eight. Look, to me, based on my experience covering this team and covering this league, that's a pretty big deal. So that's what I'm that's all I'm saying. The path there, root for the Cardinals to beat the Seahawks. Root for the Giants to beat the Eagles. Root for the Chargers to beat the Chiefs. And the Titans could be picking fourth in the draft. Yeah, I think I love that you ran through it all. I think it's very good for our listeners, very educational. Uh, realistically, though, I don't think they're getting to four. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pin my realistic hopes on them getting to six, right? Because correct me if I'm wrong there. The Giants beat the Eagles. That's enough, right? When the Titans lost, they get to six. If that happens, there's rumors the Eagles might be resting multiple players in this game. Um, you know, they're probably not going to win the division. The Cowboys win the division automatically if they beat the commanders who are like not even mentally present anymore, in my opinion, in week 18. <laughs> so um, I think most realistically is they get to six. Um, I, that would, in my opinion, be good. It would be tremendous. In fact, uh, I know it's only one spot, but I'd go as far as saying getting to six increases their chances significantly of getting the left tackle that they want, or at least one of the two premium left tackles. Because, you know, if you're there at seven, you're counting on multiple, multiple teams to pass on those left tackles. You know, if you're at six, you know Marvin Harrison Jr. is probably going number three all of a sudden to not get one of those tackles. They need to go four and five. To me, and maybe I'm silly, that makes a big difference than them not needing to go four, five, and six, right? If you stay at seven or you move down to eight, four, five, six, seven. So if you're at six, I think you got a great chance to get one of those tackles. Of course, I want them to get to four, but my, realistically, I'm hoping for a Giants win there. I don't think the Chargers are beating the Chiefs. I don't think the Cardinals are beating the Seahawks. I'm rooting for that Giants win there uh, against a, hopefully a Philly team that's benching Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, yada, yada, uh, and Titans move up to number six overall. That would be a great outcome. That would be a great outcome. And a simple way of thinking about this, if it helps anybody out there, for each one of those other teams that win, if the Titans lose, for each of the, the Cardinals, the Chargers, and the Giants, for every team that wins, that's one spot up the Titans move. So if one of those teams win, the Titans move up one spot. If two of those teams win, the Titans move up two spots. If all three teams win, the Titans move up that's three spots. That's a great way to, to simplify four. it. So there you go. That is what you're looking at in week 18. And hey, if you want to be the guy rooting for the Titans to be the Jags, like I said, I'm not going to fault Absolutely. you for it. Have fun with your team the last week of the season. Justin, we've been going almost 50 minutes here. Anything else you want to say before we get out? I really wanted to talk about Ryan Tannehill's comments. Can I just say something really quickly? Because I know we've been running really long. I thought Ryan Tannehill gave one of the most honest post-game interviews of his career. You know what it reminded me of? Uh, it reminded me of a, a, a couple that nose is nearing the end of their relationship and maybe they start to be a little bit more honest maybe they stop holding back some of those punches they would have held in when they cared more about the other person's feelings okay because number one i thought the john wick reference was hilarious i couldn't believe he said that that he felt like john wick 
at the end of uh, the game. And I'm sure everyone here has probably seen John Wick or knows what it's about. He's essentially saying, I've been beaten, battered, bruised this whole time. Um, almost a direct shot at the O-line, in all honesty. And I thought even more honest of him. Did you see the part where Paul Kowarski was talking about, I think it was Paul Kowarski who asked him, you know, what's going wrong? And Tannehill started by giving a pretty diplomatic answer. We got to throw the ball better. We got to protect better. And then Paul Kowarski, I think it was again, followed up with an outstanding question, outstanding follow-up question. He said, do you feel like there are some plays where you have no chance? And Ryan Tannehill looked at him. Go watch it if you haven't. He got like a little glimmer in his eye. Like he, you know, like like the thought process was, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. He said, Yeah, maybe. Yep. There there were. I mean, frankly, there were yeah. plenty of plays where he had no chance. Yeah. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Again, does he say that if he's still the starting quarterback and it's week five? Probably not. But I love that he's comfortable saying it in week 17 when he knows he's out the door anyway. Good for him. I, yeah, don't, I, think, I don't blame him. I don't blame him either. And I think that's as good an indication as any that the Titans don't have any plans to bring Ryan Tannehill back in 2024. Not, not that, that he, we expected them to, but... Back. Right, exactly. He's ready, ready to move on as well. I think uh, as we're talking about this and closing out the episode, I want to kind of quickly talk about the Christmas presents that the quarterbacks gave to the offensive line this year. So Will Levis, if you didn't see this on social media or elsewhere, Will Levis gave the offensive line suitcases for Christmas this year, and Ryan Tannehill gave them watches. So what is Will Levis saying? He's saying, pack your bags, get the hell out of town, because you guys can't protect anybody. And Ryan Tannehill's saying, here's a clock, so you know how quickly yeah. you're getting beat. borrowed time, pal. <laughs> yeah, that too. But like, here, here, time how long it takes me to get sacked after I, after you snap the ball to me. Here's a watch to, to help you out. I think those two gifts symbolically are just awesome to see at the and, end of this season. And, and because we're always full of statistical information on this show, uh, to the second part of that, uh, the timing, Titans gave up five of the 20th fastest sacks this weekend. Five of the top 20. Wow, this in one game. For next weekend. gen stats. Yeah, just the 20 yeah. fastest sacks that were given up this past weekend, Titans gave up five of them. Wow, that is uh, just another another stat to show how important it is that this team will be nothing next year. They will not improve as a team if they don't improve as an offensive line. That is the bottom line, I think, the biggest takeaway of the entire season for me. All right, that'll do it for this one. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with us this entire way during the end of a miserable season, but it's off-season mode. Titans fans, we are fully in off-season mode, which means it's time to get excited. It's hope season. It's get better as a team season. It's we ha nothing can go wrong season because we haven't started playing any more games yet season. <laughs> That's where we're at. I think it's going to be a fun off-season, Justin. It's always more fun to cover a team that is picking high in the draft because there are better prospects to talk about, fewer options to debate through. You kind of know you have a much better idea of who the players on the board are going to be and who the Titans might be able to pick. So I think it'll be a fun fun offseason to cover also with the team having so much ca salary cap space is going to be a fun aspect of things as well so we'll get into all that as we move forward like justin said next week we're going to pick some of these free agents and talk through should the titans re-sign them should they let them walk and also start looking more at a closer look at the draft and other free agents on other teams because after next week it'll be finalized that's it. we'll have a final it's draft quarter i'm excited to talk about that with you me too maybe we'll do a, another way too early mock draft maybe we'll look at like a top 10 mock draft here to see who could be on the board when the titans are picking in the first round all right that'll do it make sure you're subscribed to the channel the music city audible podcast remember to leave a comment below outside of receiver and left tackle what position do you want to see the titans attack the, the hardest this off season follow justin on twitter at justin m underscore nfl you can follow me at titans film room and we'll be back next week until then y'all stay safe out there and tighten up A Broadway Sports Media Production.